Hello and welcome to the Road to Psychology podcast, episode 6. I am your host, Deirdre Ferreter. Today's episode is with Dr. Sharon Lambert. Sharon is an applied psychologist and lecturer in the University College Cork with a background in forensic psychology. In this episode, Sharon and I talk about her career thus far and her work in advocating for social change. I really, really enjoyed our conversation and for me, it put into perspective the quest for career in psychology and what's really important. And so I hope you take something from the episode and thanks so much for listening. So I'd like to welcome Sharon, Dr. Sharon Lambert. Thanks so much for agreeing to do the interview today, Sharon. Um, just to start off, can you tell us about your road to becoming a psychologist? I went to college as a mature student when I was 23. And um, I had in my head an idea of what psychology would be about. Um, I suppose I was probably reading more stuff around forensic psychology. So in my head, psychology, before I started, was either forensic or our mental health stuff. Um, and then I went and I did the psychology degree. And at the time in our department, there was a couple of people who were doing a lot of research in forensic psychology. So there was quite an emphasis on it. Um, I don't know if you remember, there was the Coping Project, which was um, looking at uh, pedophile information networks in Europe. So that was quite a large project that was going on in our department. So there was quite a forensic uh, feel to the place and um, I did my degree and then I went straight into doing a PhD. And what was your PhD in? My PhD was on female sex offenders. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, so I suppose at the time and still even now there was very limited um, research in the area and very little published. It, it, even in, it's been a long time since I looked at that area but even in, since then very little has moved moved on in terms of, of the work in, in looking at women who might have um, deviant sexual interests. Um, I think in the past, when women were involved in sexual crimes, there was always a sense that they were victims and they were in some way in co- coerced. And um, there's certainly literature that would say that just like men who commit sexual offences, that there's a, lots of different types of women who commit sexual offences. And the notion that they are all coerced and vulnerable is, is just not true. Um, but definitely it's an area that still needs more research. Um, if you take, for example, male sex offenders, there are risk assessment tools for men who commit sexual offences. There are none for females. Um, and often in criminal justice systems, women are still treated more so as a victim when they they are involved in those crimes in a way that, that men are not. So I think there's, there's still some work to do in, in, in that area. Mm. And did you find that people were less likely to report um, sexual abuse by women? Or? Yeah, so there was, um, there's a couple of reasons. So there, there's, there was a gender bias for sure and a lack of recognition. And there's, from looking at the literature, there's, there's a couple of barriers to reporting. So in relation to women who sexually abuse children, women tend are more likely to sexually abuse children within the family, children that are very well known to them. So in those circumstances, those children can sometimes be less likely to report. Also, the, the average age of the victim tended to be younger, of which, of course, makes it much more complicated for children to report. And also that the abuse tended to go on for longer periods of time. So it had become much more normalized. In terms of victims themselves and their perceptions of the behavior as abuse, that was complicated as well because the abuse tended to occur in relationships that were close relationships so it was often different difficult for for victims to interpret the situation as abuse um, in a way that wasn't as blurred i suppose when it came to male offenders so in terms of the victims themselves there were certain issues around recognizing what was going on and then within the systems themselves so um so child protection and criminal justice systems there was a reluctance to acknowledge it as a crime so often the woman would be seen as psychologically impaired as opposed to sexually deviant so for for a couple of different reasons those crimes are are not as detected as they ought to be Um, I think it's very important to say that all of the literature shows that women do commit less sexual crimes than men. Men commit more sexual crimes, but when they do occur, there are certainly barriers in terms of reporting them and in terms of recognising them. And how did you conduct that research? Was it interviews with victims or 
So I did a couple of different things. So one of the first things that I did was I did a survey with lots of professionals, so psychologists and social workers, and I looked at how many victims people had worked with and then how many offenders people had worked with and there was a big difference um, so people were more likely to know victims but less likely to know offenders and then I asked people to rate what they thought the characteristics of the women were so I looked at existing typologies and the most common typology is um, from Matthews, Matthews and Speltz in the States and they divided women who abused children into three categories the teacher lover um, the predisposed and the male coerced. So the teacher lover is um, an older woman with a younger person who sees herself as in some kind of mentoring role. Then the predisposed, it was argued, was women who had been victimized themselves and therefore were predisposed. And then there was the male coerced. So we presented those typologies to say of the women that you are aware of which one of these categories do you think they would fall into we also added on sexually deviant because that wasn't something that was in the typologies at the time and it was interesting to see that um, a lot of professionals did tick the sexually deviant one for the ones where they ticked teacher lover and predisposed i suppose i have questions around that in terms of as, as, as a psychologist if you presented that survey to a group of professionals and you were talking about men who'd sexually abused children and if you said it was a teacher lover role I just don't think it would fly also in terms of predisposed there are lots of different types of people who commit sexual offenses most people who have been victims of sexual abuse do not go on to become offenders themselves so uh, it is not something that you see in the typology of male offenders you don't see anybody saying oh the reason why he offended was because he was predisposed that may well be true um, but it's not it's, it's not recognized as, as something um, within the typologies um, so that was one of the studies. So that was interesting to see. Uh, what was very interesting as well was that um, the majority of people who participated in the study had never received any training specifically related to female sexual offending. And that most professionals acknowledged that um, there was uh, no clear risk assessment tool and no clear uh, management our policies. Now it was interesting for people to say that there was no clear policies in relation to female who sexually abuse children because with all crime we don't break crime down by policies. We don't have gendered policies for crime. For so for example, if somebody's involved in car theft, we don't have a separate policy for male car thieves and female car thieves. So it was interesting that professionals were saying in their qualitative feedback, we do not have a policy to address issue this issue. So that was interesting from a psychologist's point of view, why professionals would think that the policy that they currently had was exclusively speaking to male offenders. So I think there's a lot of issues there. So that was one thing that we did. Then I also was involved in interviewing some women who were involved in a paedophile website that was written by women for, for women. So talking to them about their sexual experiences and their deviant sexual interests and I also asked them about the typologies and what did they think. So their feedback on the typologies was, uh, and it was interesting just to kind of summarize in general, what they said was all of those typologies seem to suggest that the woman is in some way um, has a deficit. Mm -hmm. And the women who did the e-interviews with me who described themselves as having a sexual interest in children, all except one of them had a university qualification um, and were financially stable and had come from uh, a good socioeconomic background. So they didn't agree with the typologies. Um, what was interesting as well in terms of the research we did with them was they had exactly the same cognitive distortions that male offenders have. Mm -hmm. So things like sex with children is natural, children come on to adults, um, it's not harmful if it's part of a loving and giving relationship. The only cognitive distortion that they had that you wouldn't see, see in the male sex offender literature was that they would say that all of the women, certainly that I interviewed, said that they were not prepared to be involved with a man in the relationship with the child because they felt that men were much more coercive in sexual relationships than women. But everything else they said was exactly the same as the, the typical cognitive distortions that you would expect to see in a, in a male sexual offender population. Was that really difficult work to do, to interview women like that? 
Like, how did you stay objective? At the time, it wasn't. And I suppose this is something that I think about because I think that when, when I was younger and I was interested in forensic psychology, I was always interested in things were interesting from a psychological point of view and from a theoretical point of view. And I suppose now that I'm older and I'm a mother, um, you think about the world in a different way. And uh, it's much harder to be objective about data uh, than it was was then because you're almost talking, you know, you're talking about something that's outside of you and outside of your space. And then I suppose as I got older and I became a mother, it was just not work that I wanted to do anymore because it would have impacted on my parenting. Yeah, it's really interesting. I don't know if you've heard of the podcast Mental Illness Happy Hour. Um, no. The host of that, um, he was a victim of what he called covert incest by his mother. I don't know if that's a recognized term. But when I heard about that, it like blew my mind. It was just the way, if it, I'd really recommend anyone listen, anyone listening to listen to it, but it was like the way he described it, it wasn't like you'd see, like you'd imagine, you know, someone being sexually abused. But it, over the years, it was like a lot of small things and you can see how someone wouldn't report that, you know, just that kind of stuff. That's, that's certainly supported in the literature that the abuse tended to be over a longer duration of time, starts at an earlier age, more likely to be in the context of a close familial relationship. So the, the behaviours that are under the law, abusive, mm. um, can become distorted and it can be hard to separate out what part of this is, is abuse and what part of this is, is, is over-mothering. Over-mothering was something that can come up sometimes. So things like bathing children when you shouldn't be because they're much too old for that and touching them in places where you shouldn't be touching them. But is this somebody who's over parenting or is this somebody who's getting sexual pleasure from their activity? Um, so there were things like, so if you think about in terms of the leeway that women have with children. So if you go to, you know, a swimming pool and you see a mother in a dressing room with her children, you're less likely to, it's the society that we live in where you're less likely to be suspicious of the mother's behavior. If you do see something odd, you might say, God, that's, you know, that's odd. And I remember saying it to somebody one time, if, if you said to, to somebody, there's a woman living next door to me and she still sleeps in the same bed as her 14 year old son, you'd say that's weird. Um, if you said there's a man who lives next door to me and he sleeps in the same bed as his 14 year old daughter, you would probably contact Child Protective Services. So I think there's a kind of a cultural assumption that women are not sexual beings. And uh, if they're not sexual beings, they're not capable of being sexually deviant and of perpetrating sexual harm. So even when we see something, uh, our cultural bias uh, in relation to women kicks in. Very important, though, to go back and say that while it does occur, um, it is a smaller percentage, but that doesn't take away from people who are victims of that. Um, and I think if we, if we don't, if we're not careful about the language we use in relation to sexual, sexual offending, you're, you're at risk really of um, telling victims that there's something different about their abuse. And I know that that was, that was uh, work that was done by... Uh, dean of in Canada where she looked at experiences of victims and they tended to disclose their sexual abuse more times than um, victims of male perpetrated abuse and sometimes the responses from professionals were you know just disbelief and shock and it shut them down then and they were less likely to report it and even in terms of the messaging that you give or if somebody comes in to work with a professional whether it's a psychologist or a police officer if they're if you get a feeling that they're going to start talking about abuse and if you assume the gender of the perpetrator and if you're incorrect then are they going to feel like what happened to them was different and they're weird and that was what victims reported they said there must be something wrong with me i must be weird because this doesn't happen um or it also causes them to not be able to interpret what they've experienced as 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 abuse because it hasn't been acknowledged by people around them. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, you mentioned you studied psychology as a mature student. Did you always know you wanted to work in psychology or something like that? Um, I wanted to be a guard. 
uh, I wanted to be a police officer because I always wanted to catch bad guys. Um, <laughs> I've spoken about this before in another podcast. If anyone's heard that before, apologies for the repetition. But I wanted to be a guard and I was too short. Um, you had to be five foot five, I think, uh, back in the olden days. You don't have to be now. Uh, and I'm only five foot three and a bit. Uh, so Really tall and zoom. You know, I look really tall and zoom. Um, small chair. Um, so... Yeah, so that's, I suppose, I was always interested in why people ended up doing really bad, awful things. And I guess I, my, I didn't know much about psychology, so in my limited amount of information that I had, I thought that, oh, that's a policing issue. So that's originally what I wanted to do, and then I was too short, and then I went to the UK, and it wasn't a great time to be joining the police because it was political violence uh, going on between our two countries and uh, then I came back and I had started to read I guess about psychology and um, became very interested in that and realized that what I didn't want was to be a police officer it was actually to understand the reasons why people end up in, in very difficult situations. When I finished uh, my PhD I was working in on Garda Shekana and Templin Moor and I think that's really when I was working on Gary Shikana was when I understood that there are very few bad people, very few bad people. There are a lot of people who are involved in crime and the reasons why they're involved in crime are very complicated and complex. And it's not as simple as that people are bad. So people who are involved in crime are involved in crime because of poverty and marginalization, because they've experienced a lot of trauma themselves as children and um, lots of different reasons. Um, so I'm glad that I did psychology because um, it was what I wanted. It was to understand why people end up in situations that they're in. And because I can view it as a psychologist, I can view it from a place of compassion and you can advocate for earlier interventions so that people don't end up in the criminal, criminal justice system. Most people who are in the criminal justice system are there because some other system has let them down along the way. I think what a lot of people think of forensic psychology, they think, serial killers, you know, very extreme crimes where it's also victims and preventing crime, isn't it? And, you know, I suppose social justice as well. Yeah, I mean, the reality of um, forensic, so forensic psychology is defined as the application of psychology to any aspect of the criminal justice system. So forensic psychology can be involved in policing. So what does forensic psychology look like in policing? So uh, in, some, in some countries, forensic psychologists are involved in interviewing and um, new recruits and um, so they would have kind of an occupational forensic psychology route you have forensic psychologists who deliver training within policing contexts you have forensic psychologists who are involved in investigative processes and you have forensic psychologists who are involved in research in policing and um, then you can have forensic psychologists um, in probation and in the prison service and um, so um all along that criminal justice route, you, you can have forensic psychologists involved. I suppose for me, um, if you're working that far up the stream, something has gone wrong somewhere. There's too many people who are ending up in the criminal justice system who have complex social problems and mental health problems and had the, the opportunity to intervene earlier um, if that had happened then you wouldn't have so many people involved in the criminal justice system so I guess as a psychologist um, I'm more interested in in intervention and prevention now I guess than than firefighting very very far down along the stream and I think that that's where I'd like to be is in that space where you can advocate for people who um, because of choices that are often not their choices or situations that they've been put in where they've very limited power and uh, they've ended up in a criminal justice system. Um, you mentioned like childhood trauma and you were part of a team of researchers who studied adverse childhood experiences and homelessness. Can you tell us about that research and how you conducted that? Yeah, so the adverse childhood experiences um, 
is not, I suppose it's a big buzzword at the moment, but it's not something that's, that's new. Uh, people have known since the 60s and 70s, if, in fact, if not earlier, um, about the impact of stress and trauma on the, 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 the body. So I think the term allostatic load is around since the late 60s. And that's a concept that your body is only capable of absorbing a certain amount of stress and then you have wear and tear. In the last 10 years, uh, 20, 10, 15 years, we've had huge advances in MRI techniques. So we know more about the developing brain now than we ever knew. So we know that um, exposure to a lot of stress, toxic stress in particular, which is uh, adverse childhood experiences. So exposure to toxic stress um, has an impact on a child's emotional, social um, and cognitive development. And once you start to have a negative impact on children's development, it can cause very serious consequences for them during their adolescence and adulthood, like risk-taking behaviors and reduced opportunities in education and employment. So the adverse childhood experiences scale is a 10 item scale that was developed by Felitti et al in the Center for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente. And they did a very large scale study and, and they used 10 items. And what they found was um, people who had four or more um, of these items um, were at increased risk for a range of uh, poor outcomes in terms of physical health, mental health and social outcomes. So Sometimes there can be a narrative around people who use drugs and people who are experiencing homelessness that they are um, immoral people who have made very bad choices and that they have um, ended up in these situations because they've made those choices. And anybody who works in addiction and homelessness will know that in the main, there tends to be a client group who have experienced a lot of adversity in their childhood and who continue to experience adversity in their adulthood. So to say that they are people who are making very bad choices is not true. In fact, they have no choices. And for many, the level of trauma that they've experienced, but for the fact that they're using drugs and alcohol to cope with it, they may have, they may have actually ended their own lives because the emotional pain that they experience is, is, is so deep. So we, we, we looked at um, 50 service users in Cork Simon community and looked at their levels of ACEs um, and they were very significant, much higher than you would expect in the, in the general population. One of the things I'd like to say about that 10 item scale is that the 10 item scale looks at abuse, neglect and household dysfunction and it looks at adversity in the context of the family home. Now, in terms of the, the adversity that can happen in in the context of the family home, we know that one of the biggest predictors of um, mental health and substance dependence is poverty. And many people are in poverty, not because they are bad people and they've made bad choices. They're in poverty because of structural issues and government policies um, that keep poor people um, where they are and don't promote social mobility. So uh, when you have large pockets of areas where you put people into social housing and you don't put in appropriate infrastructure to allow them to flourish and to reach their potential. And they have limited access to good education and good employment. Then you have poverty. When you have poverty, you have stress. And when you have stress, you have mental health. And sometimes when you have mental health, you have substance dependence. And obviously then that does increase some of the, the adversity within the home. But the problem with using the 10 item scale is that it doesn't acknowledge that the reasons why many of these families are experiencing adversity in their home is because they live in a, a societal structure that doesn't allow them to flourish or grow. Interesting. Um, I assume you've read it yet. Did you read that book in the realm of hungry ghosts? No, I haven't read anything uh, for years because the children are really small. So when I'm, uh, <laughs> by the time I finish... <laughs> oh, brilliant. You'll have to it's, send me a list of all your recommendations. The Boer Mate, it's all about that. It's like... Um, oh, I know working. what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've been dipping in and out. Yeah, my concentration in the evening time is very poor. Yes. The way he put it was, I found it really interesting. It was like, if you've had, you know, a difficult childhood and a lot of stress, when you take on a substance, it has a, be it has a bigger impact for you. So you're more likely to become addicted to the substance, you know. So I just found that There's so interesting. Lots of people use drugs. Mm. Lots of people do. And 
actually most people who use drugs use drugs recreationally and they can get up and they can go to work. If you're using drugs um, because you're trying to mask emotional pain, it works. Mm -hmm. So you will continue to use it. Um, there is a lecturer in clinical pharmacy in UCC, Dr. Kevin Murphy, and he did his, P I worked in an addiction service and, and um, Dr. Kevin Murphy did his PhD with us. He was looking at benzodiazepine use in, in young boys in Cork. And um, the title of, of one of the papers that came out of his PhD was You Just Don't Feel. And that's why they were taking benzodiazepines at a level to which they had become dependent and it was causing them all sorts of personal problems and social problems and legal problems. They took them because they worked. Mm -hmm. it, it allowed them to feel okay. It allowed them to have peace in their head and to be able to get on during the day and to function in some kind of a way. On the outside, when other people are looking at it, they don't see it as functioning. They see it as absolute dysfunction. And if you're approaching an individual like that in a trauma-informed way, it means that you understand that somebody has ended up in substance dependency because they've been finding it really difficult to manage their, their own mental health and their own emotional distress. So if somebody comes into you and they're using all the substances, rather than being judgmental and having a moral approach to it, you say, you know, I think you're amazing. I think you're amazing that you've, you know, kept going every day and, you know, you went and you started using substances because you weren't able to access the supports that you needed and you found something that helps you to survive every day. The problem with what, what's happening is that those things that helped you in the beginning are now causing you huge amounts of pain and you're not functioning in the way that you could if you were well. Um, but, you know, that's why I would be an advocate of a harm reduction policy, which is the national policy. That our, our, there are national drug policies, a harm reduction policy, because you can't take somebody who lives in deprivation or who's trying to manage serious mental health or somebody who's experienced something really traumatic and they've got PTSD symptoms and they're trying to manage flashbacks. You can't bring them into a service and say, right, I'm you know, that stuff that you've been taking for the last five or six years that has helped you to be able to manage your own head. Now I'm going to take it all away from you. Mm -hmm. um, you can't do that. It's a very slow, gradual process where you have to build somebody up before you get to a point where it's safe for them to leave their drugs to one side. And I suppose that's why things like housing first and things are so important. Like how do you Absolutely. expect someone to be staying in a shelter and dealing with that much stress and mm. not take the one thing that gets them through the day? Do you know? Yeah, so the housing first is absolutely fantastic because if you think about particularly psychology, um, you know, we have, you know, lots of great therapeutic tools, et cetera, et cetera. But we can't forget the very first thing that we learned in psychology, and that's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if you don't meet somebody's basic physiological needs for shelter and food and safety, you can't do any therapeutic work mm -hmm. with somebody who is frightened because they don't know where they're sleeping tonight or the shelter that they're sleeping in is a really scary place to be. Um, you know, so by, and, and housing first is a number of different studies done around the world in relation to housing first. Denmark in particular has been extremely successful with this. So it has shown to work. If you provide somebody and meet their basic needs and then you can start, and once they feel physically and emotionally safe, then you can start to tackle some of the other issues like their mental health issues and their drug issues. We have a major problem in our country in that we have very, very limited dual diagnosis services. So most people who have, who use drugs and alcohol when they present to mental health services will not be seen because they'll be told to go to an addiction service. And if their mental health needs are quite chronic, an addiction service is not going to be, want to take their substances away from them if they're not linked in with the mental health service. Um, every it, it feels like every couple of weeks you'll see a newspaper article where a mother or a father is talking about the fact that their child has died and that they've died from an overdose or they have died from suicide because they've presented a number of times to different services and neither service has felt that that service was, was the one for them and they've been rejected. So when people are really in their boots and they're rejected like that over and over the, again, how do you expect them to keep going? 
we did a study a couple of years ago on the impact of drug and alcohol related death on families. And it's absolutely horrific. The stigma and shame that stops people from accessing help before they die. And then the stigma and shame that's left with the family after their loved one has died, which causes a complex bereavement. Um, it was interesting, you know, for all of the families who participated in our study, most of them have said that, you know, they didn't really feel grief for the first three years. They felt nothing. And the other place where you see that is in the suicide literature, you know. So, you know, a long time ago in Ireland, it's not actually even a long time ago, it's when I was younger, um, suicide in Ireland carried huge shame. It was a criminal offence. It was a sin against God, et cetera, et cetera. When people died in Ireland by suicide, it was often hidden. And people would say that it was a fireman accident or something like that because they were ashamed to say that their loved one had died by suicide. And we have moved very far in terms of reducing the stigma in relation to suicide. We have not reduced the stigma in relation to people who use drugs. And as long as we continue to stigmatize a group of people that I consider have very huge mental health needs, as long as we continue to stigmatize them, they will really struggle to access services and support when they need it. And the impact on the family is absolutely horrific. Um, one of the findings from that research with the Simon community that I found really interesting was that you did the ACE survey with the staff as well, and that you found that staff with higher ACE scores had a higher likelihood of burnout. Am I putting that right? For people who had higher levels of A scores, they were slightly statistically more likely to experience burnout. Yeah. So um, we'd need to do a lot more data collection in that before you'd say that that was a fact, because what it may be is that if you, if you think about people who are attracted to, to helping roles, they tend to be people who have very high levels of empathy. Um, there is research that shows that having very high le levels of empathy um, can um, increase your susceptibility to burnout. So, you know, were they at risk of burnout because of their higher levels of ACEs or were they at risk for burnout because they had higher levels of empathy? So that's something that needs to be explored a little bit more. I suppose people who do have a lot of ACEs and talking to them, some will say that it hasn't impacted on them and other people will say it will, that when they meet a client who maybe has had a similar journey to them, that they can perhaps over empathize and maybe go, you know, 130% at a cost to themselves. Now that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be working in the service. I suppose the learning from that is that everybody in the service is susceptible to burnout and particularly people who care a lot about their service users. Um, so there's an obligation on services to provide um, a really safe, emotionally safe working environment for their staff. So if you think about it, if you're working as a psychologist out in the community or if you're a psychotherapist or a counsellor, you're obliged to go for supervision once a month. Mm. You're supposed to go and talk to somebody about the impact of the work on your mental health to make sure that you are doing okay and that your job isn't impacting on you or your family or back on your clients. And if you think about other professionals like social care workers, paramedics, um, guardy, firefighters, uh, other people in frontline services, um, they actually see things that a psychologist will never see because psychologists tend to be sitting in their offices and somebody comes to them. And if somebody's coming to visit you on a particular day, they're probably in a good place because they've managed to get up and get dressed and make their appointment on time. If you think about the other professionals who are working in front line, they're dealing with crisis and chaos and the trauma and the trauma reactions, which sometimes look aggressive. And um, they witness assaults, they witness people self-harming, they witness people who die by suicide. They, they hear you know, really horrific stories and sometimes get to witness some of those events. And um, while most organizations now have employee assistance programs, you know, where staff can apply, can avail of, you know, um, sessions of counseling, a lot of people don't use those services because in order for people to use those services, you have to have a culture in an organization that actually acknowledges the fact that the work that they do is traumatic. And if it's built into what you do every day, 
then it becomes an automatic, like it would never occur to me. I would never, ever, ever think of it to be unusual for me to go and see a psychologist. So if I have any kind of stress at all or any kind of worry or anything like that, I have a psychologist that I will go to. It doesn't seem at all unusual. Mm. It, it's like going to get your hair done. Uh, or if you have a sore toe and you go to the podiatrist, if your head is hurting because you've got a lot of stuff in your head, it just, I wouldn't blink an eye to pick up the phone and make an appointment to go and see a psychologist because obviously I've no stigma in relation to that because that's my training. So I think we need to do a lot more in terms of frontline workers and creating a culture that acknowledges that the job that they do is really difficult. There are some people where it's not difficult and it doesn't impact on them, but there are lots of people where their job impacts on them. So we have to have a culture in organizations that that understanding permeates through every single policy and procedure so that when somebody is struggling, that it doesn't seem like a big deal, like a, a failure. You're a failure if you ring um, a, a, the employee assistance program to seek help for your mental health. We can't have systems like that. It has to be, you know, if you had a pain in your toe, you'd have no problem ringing them about that. It's the same if your head is feeling overwhelmed. You have to be able to have that ease within yourself to be able to pick up the phone and not have any stigma about it. So we need to do more work in relation to that too. Maybe like debriefing as well, making debriefing normal after seeing an, an event as opposed to just motoring on because I suppose... I, I'll link it in the show notes, but I listened to a podcast about PTSD before and it was like, the sooner you get in after an event and you intervene, it'll prevent, you know, long-term effects of maybe seeing like a car accident or something like that that could really have an impact on you. Yeah, lots of organisations are have had their resources diminished, you know, um, in the last 10 years. So what you have now is you have less time for people sitting around even having a cup of tea at the end of the day. So ideally in, in an organization, if you were working on a shift with somebody that there is a space that's built in that every day there's an opportunity to check in that people are just rushing out and the next people rushing in. That has happened in, in most organizations because of resource issues that people find it very hard to find a space in the day to debrief. In relation to debriefing as well, one of the things is that yes, debriefing is great and you should definitely do it. Um, some organizations sometimes try to implement mandatory debriefing and then they select what the what the appropriate incident is and the problem with that is that if you have attended an incident and there was six of you there and three of the three of you thought it was traumatic and three of you didn't and then you're forcing all six people into the same room what's the the effectiveness of that and then you will have incidents um that people might not necessarily considered to be traumatic but for one of the people who's been involved there it has brought something up for them and an organization might not necessarily think that a debriefing is appropriate in that context but there will be one person there who's been very badly affected so the subjective nature of the exposure to traumatic events is something that we always have to be very mindful of mm, it's really interesting um when I volunteered for AWARE, they always had a debrief after every meeting, but then they introduced as well that you'd get a call once a month just to check in how you were doing. That was really good. I think if, if you could have that in all services, that you have a debrief and then you have somebody who calls to check in and who says, this is what's available for you, please use it. And the more people you have in an organization that are prepared to admit that they too sometimes struggle and that they too sometimes um, want to access services. I know that sometimes if I go to talk to a group of people where, you know, the idea of sharing your feelings or feeling traumatized about something, you know, I know that when I, I go to those organizations where people feel like they can talk freely, and, you know, I might give examples from my own life of times where I felt very stressed um, and the impact it might have had, we'll say, on my parenting or relationships and things like that. And you can see everybody in the audience nodding their heads. And, you know, you know that they've had those experiences, too, but because they haven't come from a psychology background um, where it's just absolutely OK to be not OK, um, that 
the culture is it there and and there's a huge freedom when one person says it one person says when such and such thing happened the other day I really struggled and when I went home I was a bit mean to the kids and I didn't sleep so well that night and I drank more than I should have and I feel like crap today and I think if people were were more honest about that you'd be really surprised about the amount of people who are, are feeling the same we can't end up in a culture where you're not allowed to be not okay mm. Um, so I put it out to the assistant psychologist group about questions for you. And there was loads, obviously. <laughs> um, so there's a few career questions now. So what advice would you give to an aspiring psychologist to achieve a balance between their career and personal goals, for example, starting a family? Yeah. The things that were important to me before I had children are not things that are important to me now. Mm. Um, and... I think that when you have children, you need to be very mindful about the job that you have. If you work in a very, very stressful job, have you got sufficient support that you do feel debriefed when you come home or are you bringing your job home? Is your job impacting on your ability to parent? So if I give an example, I I worked with, with, with young people years ago who were really struggling, you know, very, very difficult, complex situations and they had nothing and, you know, were really up against a lot of systems. And then, you know, you're, you're looking at them and they're just gorgeous young people and there's so much, so many barriers in their way to just access and education and employment and housing and, you know, how they sometimes are perceived in the criminal justice system as being really bad when people can't see how wounded they are and your heart would just break sometimes, you know, when you'd work with some of those young people and then you come home to your own house and you have your children who were eating their organic vegetables and... <laughs> you know, access to after school activity and large network of friends and family who adore them. And I remember when my children were very small and I did that work and I'd come home and I remember one time my, one of my little kids, she, she started to cry and she wanted a rice cake and I took out a rice cake and it was an organic rice cake and I gave it to her and she started crying because it was white. She wanted a pink one. And I remember looking at her and she was only about four and I remember thinking that she was a privileged little shit and that I was going to have to drop her into a homeless shelter to spend the night so she could get a grip and realize how difficult the world was and how privileged she was. But of course, it's absolutely appropriate when you're four to be disappointed about the, the, the color of your rice cake. And I think what I, I realized around that time was that my reality and my kids' reality were very different places. So during the daytime, I spent a lot of time surrounded by a lot of darkness um and then i came home and my children had spent their day surrounded in light and it was not always easy for me to see the world from their perspective and um i think i was probably sometimes harder on them than i should have been so i think it's really so there's jobs that i have done that i have absolutely loved but they wouldn't be appropriate for me now. So an example would be forensic psychology. And I know that I, I've spoken to others who, who have worked, not necessarily psychologists, it might be police officers or investigators that work in social media companies, you know, that are involved in investigations in relation to child pornography and, and child abuse images. Sorry, child pornography is an inappropriate term, child sexual abuse images. And, you know, especially for them, they'd say that when they became parents that the work changed, you know, and I remember talking to a woman one time who said that she would bath her children every single night when she collected them from the crash because it was, she wanted to make sure that they hadn't been harmed and she didn't want to be seen to be physically looking at them. So she thought that if she bathed them, it was a way of checking mm-hmm. to make sure that they were okay. Of course, the problem with that is even though you think you're hiding your behavior, your children, especially nonverbal children, are totally reliant on nonverbal cues. So your anxious parenting behavior is going to be picked up by the children and your behavior is telling the children that the world that they live in is not safe. When actually um, the, the statistical risk to them is quite low. But that statistical risk in your head is much bigger because it's the only thing you do all day. Mm-hmm. Um, So in terms of career development, I think it's better to not pigeon your whole yourself into anything that's too specialized in psychology, because if you do and you change your mind, 
and you want to move into something different, it can be harder. Um, so having qualifications like a clinical psychology qualification. So I'm thinking in terms of people who want to work in applied contexts. So having a clinical qualification or having a counseling qualification or having an educational uh, doctor qualification, uh, you can choose to work with different populations. If you choose to just go on and do a doctorate in forensic psychology, for example, you're a forensic psychologist and that's what you are for the rest of your life. So if you don't want to work in practice, then you're going into to, to research in academia, but you would probably still be working in the space of forensic psychology. So my advice and uh, any student who's ever come into my office and asked me, that's the answer that they've gotten. Most of them ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> but but I suppose I'm just saying it from experience that the things that I was okay with when I was in my 20s are not things that would uh, allow me to have a good night's sleep in my 40s. Mm. And like I've just anecdotally heard some, especially women, I suppose, because women are going to suffer more from this, but like say there's a long road between your psychology degree and maybe getting onto a doctorate. I think the person asking that question were kind of asking like, how do you have a personal life, say you want to have kids and still be able to take maybe assistant psychologist positions that might be low paid or, you know, would you say put your personal life first? I would, but that's easy for me to say because I'm in my forties and I have my PhD and I have my job. Uh, I do know what they're talking about. I did it myself. I didn't have children until I was, was older. And uh, honestly, I wish I'd had them when I was younger. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I really do because um, you know, in terms of your physical energy and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I wish I'd had them younger. I mean, there, there's two separate questions there. Yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. question actually is, is, is it fair? The process is not fair. It is not fair that you do a psychology degree and then you go on to do a master's and that you have to work for two or three years, um, sometimes for free. And then at the end of that, not be guaranteed that you're going to get onto the program that you want. That's the issue. That's not fair. And it's not right. Um, I did it myself. It wasn't fair then and it isn't fair now. Um, and especially for those who don't make it, yeah. who don't end up uh, getting it. And then they just say, OK, I have to stop now. This is my third or fourth year going for whatever doctorate they're going for. And they say, I have to stop now. My life has been on hold. I have to stop. And they end up going into something else. Um, uh, there's a huge, huge unfairness about that system. Um, even if you were working and you were getting paid enough so that if you were getting paid enough as an assistant psychologist that you would be able to have a life as well just like any other employee that you would be able to start saving for your deposit for your house and if you want to get married if you want to have children that you can do that in a way that everybody else does but you can't because most of the time you are working for free mm -hmm. yeah so it's a, it's a tough question to ask my gut instinct is which one in 10 years time would you regret more? I'd say you'd regret if you wanted to have a family and didn't. Or I spoke about this to a student the other day because they were torn between two different programs and they considered one to have more um, status than the other. And I said, I can guarantee you when you're driving around in your pajamas with snot and <laughs> yogurt in your hair, uh, dropping a child from Camogie, going to collect another one from football, your your you your staff <laughs> it doesn't matter and for me as well like I remember when I was younger thinking about psychology and, and the status that exists within it which I also think is total bullshit but mm -hmm. uh, none of that matters to me now mm -hmm. I love the job that I do I love uh, lecturing and I love doing research I absolutely adore our students they're amazing um, and this year I have to give a massive shout out to our students this year because they had to go through uh, trying to finish programs during coronavirus and they are just the most social justice you know I just adore them and that gives me great hope and when I talk about it I say I can guarantee you when you've a snot trail down along the sleeve of your jacket all it will matter to you is have I got enough money to pay the bills so that my family is comfortable and status and esteem and none of that stuff matters what ends up mattering in the end is happiness mm -hmm. and you can be happy you know, working in an orchard. Yeah. As long as you're going back to Mass's hierarchy of needs, a doctorate is not on the first step. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so, so sometimes when you're on that treadmill, mm 
And there's a huge thing in psychology where you're in competition with other people, which makes it an even more toxic environment because you're in competition for a very small number of spaces. It can just feel very toxic. Sometimes it's really useful to stand back and actually do up a list of in 10 years time, what do I want to, there are people who don't want to get married and don't want to have children and don't want to settle down. They are, they're on a career path. If that's you, go for it. Knock yourself out. Work 20 hours a day. Get 17 publications out a year. Do two doctorates if you want. <laughs> as long as you're happy, that's all that matters. If you're somebody then who says, in 10 years time, I'd like to be living in a little cottage with some hens and growing my veg and I'd like to be working in psychology where I help people. Have a think about what that looks like. Mm -hmm. It might not be what you think it is because sometimes when you're studying psychology and learning psychology, you're not always thinking about the ways in which psychology applies outside in the world. Yeah. So, you know, you can be a researcher sitting, you could say, I'm going to be a researcher who works from home, but it's really important to me that I help people. So then what you do is you get involved in projects with marginalized groups, people who really need psychologists, the traveling community really need psychologists on their side. Their suicide rate is eight times higher than the general population. Um, you know, so there are loads of people who are experiencing homelessness, people who use drugs, people in direct provision centers. There are loads of groups of people in our society that really need our help. You might not need to be a clinical psychologist to do that. You might not need to be a counseling psychologist to do that. You might not need to be an education psychologist to do that. It might be enough to have a master's in psychology where you've got really great research skills and you set up your own company. You say, right, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do research and I'm going to make money from that. It's going to be enough to keep me going. But what I'm also going to do is with that research, I'm going to advocate for the rights of, 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 of people who, who need me. So it depends on your reason, of course, of getting into psychology. Some people get into psychology because they think they'll get loads of money. Um, it's not true. They um, <laughs> no, they don't. Um, uh, so, so I suppose looking at your own individual needs. So why do you want to be a psychologist? If you want to do it for the money, there's particular roads you go down. If you want to do it because you want to help people, just remember that that's not a narrow, a narrow view. Yeah. You can branch out, um, step back, think about it, think about where you want to be in ten years' time. I suppose if you take that label off a clinical psychologist or whatever psychologist, and you actually think about what you actually want to do, help people or psychologist, yeah, yeah, then take away the label. Loads of jobs, it. yeah. There's loads, loads of jobs. ways you could achieve that goal and still meet and, your personal goal. And if you if you're really honest with yourself, if you said I'm a psychologist. If you think about attaching an extra label to it, forensic, clinical, counseling, educational, organization, occupational, you know, why is that, that, that's almost, you know, it, so you can be a psychologist who works in a forensic setting. You can be a psychologist who works in a clinical setting. You can be a psychologist who works with marginalized groups. You can be a social justice psychologist if you want, you know, so think about what does it all mean and where do you want to be? Mm. Great. Um, what there have been times when I've regretted it, being a psychologist, you know. Really? Uh, yeah, because sometimes, sometimes, I suppose particularly in, in other jobs that I've had, not the job now, but in other jobs that I've had where a lot of my day was very dark and you're dealing with people who are really in their boots all day and the impact that that had on me. And when you're just doing, you know, work with with you know, individuals, you, you don't make system change. So sometimes you can do a lot of work with an individual, but the system hasn't changed. So everything you've done with them has actually been a waste of time because they're still battling all of those systems. So I suppose one of the things I like about the job that I have now is if you're a researcher, uh, you can make submissions to the Oireachtas um, and you can present the research that you've collected. Uh, you can collect you can collect research from people who have no voice mm. and because you have a label or a title like doctor in front of it, it opens doors for you and you can take research from those groups and you can open a door with that. And that's what makes me feel that I love the job that I do. But there are times when I haven't loved it, particularly when I was working with people where the fight that they had to put up to get their basic needs met was just horrific. Mm. 
and so unjust and so unfair. And I would find that hard. There, were, there, there have been times in the past where, where I haven't slept at night because I've been thinking about young people in particular mm. and how difficult and how unnecessarily difficult life was for them and how sometimes some structures and systems that are supposed to be there to help them, in fact, did the opposite. I actually studied social policy before I studied psychology and I think they're so relevant to each other. Like we need to change the society definitely in order to improve mental health. We can't just, you're not in a vacuum, you know, providing. No. And, and, and it's not appropriate sometimes. If you think about it, if you somebody who's living in a terrible situation, it's not always appropriate to try to deliver a psychological intervention in that context to, to, to fix them, to go back into the shit crap yeah. <laughs> that they're dealing with all every day every day and um, so i you know i assume you're aware of there's a, a group called psychologists for social change ireland um, <laughs> yeah so psychologists for social change ireland they have a twitter account and a facebook account there's also a psychologist for social change in the uk so they're a group of psychologists who recognize that we are biopsychosocial people that all of those things matter and that if you're going to focus on the psychological aspect of a person, you have to understand the biological part of them and you have to understand the social context that they're in. So for example, if you're a psychologist and you're sitting in your nice fancy office and a mom always comes late with her son and you say, right, they're, they're not interested in change, they're not motivated to change, they can't be bothered to turn up on time. If you don't think about the social context that that mother is coming from and the, and the challenges that she has to deal with in order to just get to your appointment, um, then you're, you're never going to be able to deliver an effective intervention. And I would rather work well with five people, 100% with five people, than 5% with 100 people. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's good for, for a psychologist to work in a system where you do work that you know is not going to have impact. Yeah. Um, and the mental health services are, are wholly under-resourced. So you have lots of psychologists who go in every day with caseloads that are totally unmanageable. And that must be very, very difficult for their well-being because 99.9% .9 of people who sign up to become psychologists do it because they want to help others. They don't want to go into a system that breaks people. So I do think in psychology, there is a shift. People are starting to think about the context and, and that's what that group does, um, Psychologists for Social Change Ireland. Um, you know, they look at different societal issues and the, the issue and then that those issues contribute to mental health in particular groups so i know I, i'm involved with psychologists for social change ireland and, and the two issues that we've been speaking a lot about in the last couple of weeks are obviously in relation to black lives matters and the impact of racism on mental health and uh, i suppose something we're particularly concerned about in ireland is direct provision centers and um, they are not humane they are very, very bad uh, for people's mental health, for adults' mental health, and they're bad for the social and emotional development of children. And the other issue we've been thinking about is um, the traveling community. So this week is um, Traveller Pride, and um, they are the most excluded and marginalized group uh, in Ireland. And um, the level of hate speech that is directed towards the traveling community on social media every single day is killing their young people. So, you know, as psychologists, we understand that when you are growing and you're developing, that a big part of your development is identity. And if your identity is um, fair game for hate and not just by anonymous trolls, people with their actual real social media accounts think it's okay to say the kind of things that they, they say about travelers. Um, and then they'll say things like, you know, if a traveler was arrested for something, oh, that's their culture. Uh, they have no idea what the traveler culture is. Uh, as a settled woman, I don't ever have to go on the television. So just for example, Georgia, you're a woman, I'm a woman, we're both from the settled community. If tomorrow you were caught drink driving and you crashed into the front of Pennies in Patrick Street and it was in the newspaper, I will not be asked to go on the news to defend white female women with a psychology background. Mm 
But yet, if a traveller is involved in antisocial behaviour, the travelling community are constantly asked on social media and on the media to pass a comment about why this has happened. So we other them. We other them and we generalise them. And most people don't know a traveller. Most people don't know a traveller. I'm very lucky that I know lots of uh, uh, travellers who work in the Travel Visibility Group in Cork. And the travelling women that I know are the strongest, proudest, hardest working women who carry a huge burden. Because not only do they work full time and pay their taxes, they also carry the burden of the discrimination and inequality and mental health issues in their community. There's very heavy burden on women. One of our students in applied psychology, Mary Tobin, did a study on um, complex grief in the traveling community a couple of years ago. And one of the things that came out of her study was the heavy burden that women in particular in the community face because they are always watching, waiting and worrying because suicide is at epidemic proportions within the community. So they're the kinds of things for me, there are other psychologists who'd say, no, I'm not interested in that. That's fine. For me, I'm speaking for me. For me, they're the kinds of things that psychologists have an opportunity to get involved with and to make a real change, to create a fairer society so that people can be physically and healthy, um, physically and mentally well. Um, I find that really interesting. I'm actually looking at doing an episode on that, but I've, I'd like to get a mental health professional who's also a traveller. So, but I've been looking and it's, it's probably says a lot that I can't find one, Do you know, with the like even recently the first traveler got a phd that shouldn't be the cindy. case yeah yeah so cindy be. joyce is two now so cindy joyce is a phd and um hannah mcginley uh, has a phd as well so there's two two women um from the traveling community only one percent of the traveling community have a third level qualification um not because they don't want to get an education it's because um they experience prejudice and discrimination from primary secondary and third level they don't feel welcome they don't feel wanted um i know there's a, a lady who's a traveling lady and she's studying in a university in ireland and uh she's studying a master's and uh she was last year i think it was she was walking down along the corridor in the university that she's in and somebody called her a knacker um so accepted fellow, as well that's a sickening thing fellow student yeah, yeah. so accepted it's yeah mm. And it's interesting because, you know, recently, so, so the traveling community are an indigenous community in Ireland. I don't know if you saw the study that came out from UCC uh, last week in relation to microbiomes no. and gut bacteria. So the APC um, Institute in UCC looks at gut bacteria and its relationship with physical and mental health. And uh, they've done like really, really interesting stuff. And they have just published the results of a study that they did in relation to the traveling community. And what they found is that in Ireland, the gut bacteria in the traveling community is an ancient gut bacteria. Wow. And that the more settled a traveler had become, the more their gut bacteria had changed and they had um, industrialized gut bacteria like settled people. And we know that industrialized gut bacteria is actually bad for your health. So if you talk to travelers, um, when the policy came in, um, in Ireland a long, long time ago when policy came in where they said the travellers were not allowed to be nomadic anymore. They said that the reason why they were doing that is because they would be healthier. If they had lived in houses and they had run in water and they had food and they were able to get the children into education, that they would be healthier. And that's not true. That's not what happened. Since uh, the travelling community were forced into becoming settled, their age, their average life expectancy has decreased. Yeah. So at that time, there, there are, I think there's only one traveler over the age of 70 in Ireland. Wow, that's really shocking. If you read the All, Ar the All Ireland Traveler Health Study that was completed a few years ago, I think people do not realize the level of crisis in terms of physical health and mental health that's going on in the traveling community. Um, if I was a traveling woman, I would only have about another year or two left in my life expectancy. Yeah. 
And it has nothing got to do with, with decisions that I make or, or health behaviors. It's all got to do with the impact of the stress of discrimination on your health. And they are, their life expectancy is, is very low now. They, they did a, um, in court, they looked at um, the Seven Sisters project, it was called, um, where they looked at um, seven sisters from one family. And it was, I think it was prior to the enforced um, settlement. And I think they all lived to be in their 70s or 80s. And it's just extremely rare now that you would have a tra traveler over the age of 70. And you could argue that social policy has actually created that stigma today. Oh, it totally has. Yeah. Just, yeah. I know, my, my grandmother... Has. My grandmother died in the last year. She was 95 and she remembered like a really positive relationship with travellers. They used to come around and fix things and stuff. And just Yeah, I'm the same. I remember a positive relationship with travellers when I was a child. Yeah. And in, the li in just her lifetime, it's become like it is today. You know, it's totally, you know, because like, like they said, the, that they had to settle. They couldn't be nomadic. They had, kids had to attend school. That rule, that yeah. you, you know, so you had to settle in one place to attend a school and that kind of stuff. It's really interesting to look at it that way. But, but if you look at it like, policy. yeah, it, like, and then if you look at Irish people, like a very huge percentage of Irish people are very um, discriminatory towards travellers. And if you're a psychologist and you're like that, then you don't, you haven't read psychology because you have to look at prejudice, discrimination and outgroups just to see what happens. So people say, whoa, well, their behaviour and their criminal behaviour and blah, 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 blah. Well, then you haven't read psychology the more you marginalize somebody and the more you reduce their opportunities, the more likely they're going to have chronic mental health issues and dependency issues and more likely to have less opportunity for education and employment to become involved in crime. So this isn't that we're talking about a group of people who are bad. We're talking about a group of people who have been marginalized. And, you know, if you think about Irish people, we have a very romantic notion of Native Americans because they helped us out during the famine. And it's just in my head because this year, you know, people, Irish people donated a load of money to the COVID relief fund for Native Americans in, in America. If you go to America, American people don't have a romantic notion about Native Americans. Yeah. They see them as this outgroup that you need to keep away from us that have huge issues in relation to mental health and substance dependence and criminality. And that's, and if you look at Aborigines and you look at the Bowery and you look at the Samai, uh, where you have nomadic groups that you've forced to settle and you've taken away their culture, you've created dysfunction. Mm -hmm. You've created it. And then the society that has created it blames the group for the situation that they're in when the group had no hand act uh, or uh, had no part to play in the decision making process that went around that. If, if there was one thing I could change in the next few years is um, the relationships that we have with the traveling community and their ability to live a happy, healthy life where they're not treated like an underclass in the way that they are now. We are going to disseminate. That community would be just absolutely, you know, wiped out if we continue treating them the way that we do yeah. because the, the mental health issues within that community is just horrific in terms of a podcast you might think about martin bean's ward really yeah um, martin like bean's ward is a traveler and he's a comedian and he's not a mental health worker but he certainly uh, has a lot to say in relation to mental health i think his degree might have been politics or social policy but he, he, he would have a lot to say in relation to mental health. Um, so yeah, the next question is um, more about forensic psychology, but what do you think is the likelihood for a forensic psychology doctorate? And do you think there's a need for one given Ireland's prison population? Or... Um, I don't think so. I don't think that we have sufficient levels of crime in order to um, uh, justify it, it, you know, you're, all you're doing is you're taking people in and giving them a qualification and then they would have to go abroad um, to, um, to get work. So for that reason, I think it's, un, it's inappropriate. You're creating um, graduates yeah. into a, a market space that doesn't exist. So uh, for that reason, I think it's inappropriate. I'm on to my last question. Um, do you have, what are three things in your mental health toolbox? Mine, gardening. Oh, wow. Um, absolutely gardening. Um, God, is that the only one I have? 
I, I do mindfulness sometimes. I don't do it as much as I should do, but I know when I do do it, it makes a big difference to me. And trying to have boundaries around my space. And I don't just mean work boundaries. I mean, there are times when I, I tend to be, a, I, 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 I'm a helpful person. Um, but sometimes I might be very tired I'm, or I might have my own stuff going on. And in the past, I wouldn't have been great at saying no. Um, now I'm better at saying, look, I'd really like to help you with that. But actually, it's just not a good time for me. So I think they're the three things. Thank you so much, Sharon. That's really helpful. And thanks for today. Sorry we ran over in time. It was, time just no, flew. Look, it was, <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for having Thank me. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye, bye, bye. Hi there, this is Deirdre here again. Thanks so much for listening to episode six. I really hope you enjoyed it. As usual, please like, share and subscribe. I really appreciate your feedback and sharing the podcast with as many people as possible. Um, We covered some sensitive topics in this episode, so I just wanted to highlight if anyone listening is a victim of abuse, please know that you're not alone. There is help and it's not your fault. So you have access to the Dublin Rave Crisis Centre 24-7 and they'll talk about abuse that happened at any time. You can call the Samaritans or you can call 1 and 4 and I'll put all those numbers in the show notes for the show. You can also email Samaritans if you're not comfortable talking to someone. I'd like to thank Sharon Lambert for putting me into her very busy schedule, to Desi Kelleher for providing the music for the podcast. I really love it. I hope you like it. And also, again, to Janine Grosbeck who did the graphics for the podcast. I'm so proud of them and they really come across great. So thank you so much and speak soon.